Okay, guys, looks like it's 11.30, so we are about to start. So first things first, um, I'd like to say sorry to you because I promise you there will be no slides, but there will be like three or four. But there is one thing I need to straighten up. So basically, um, you might have heard about the library called Java Slang. Well, is it carried that name for like three years, but recently it changed its name to Waver. Um, as you probably know, putting the Java somewhere in the name of your, well, of your product, it might be not a very good idea. Some guys from Poland that remember Java Sovia or Dvars Java um, know this very well. So there was a day where Java, Java part from Java slang name need to go away. And uh, Daniel Dietrich, the main owner, well, just received a new bunch of stickers. Um, he applied them to, to his laptop, um, closed close the lid, and saw actually a nice looking pattern, which looked like waiver. Um, it was a nice thing because, well, it's a nice name that you can build brand around. And the other good thing is that the new stickers could have been easily recycled. So. There were a lot of trees saved, and well, we were ready for with new stickers. Well, but since we are playing with recycling stickers, well, I had I had my own idea. I came, I took three stickers, uh, cut them, and glued them together. But for some reason, well, not many people considered my uh, submission uh, serious. Okay, so that will be all for slides. There is one more with all code that will be produced to today. I will show you, you can, you can grab it right now, or I will, I will show you it, of course, at the end. Now, not much is there, but it will be appearing soon. So grab it now if you want. People still grabbing. Okay, I assume you did that already. So that will be all when it comes to slides for today. So now, um, how many of you have an idea what what Waver actually is or Java slang? Have you have you ever used that? Or okay, not many people. Um, so another question: How many of you are using Java 8 in your in everyday work? Well, the, that's nice. With every every year, it gets the number of hands is bigger. Okay, and now the more important question: Who is not using Java 8? But but no, don't raise your hand when you're using Kotlin or Scala. Who is using? Who is forced to work with Java version that's lower than eight? Okay, some of you guys. So for those of you, I will have quite a bad news because Java slang or waiver is based is Java eight based, so you won't be able to use that. But I hope you'll be able to trans uh, move to Java eight soon. So for those of you that have no idea what waiver is. Um, Waver is a functional library for Java. When Java 8 was released, it was, it was a very special release because, well, up until that point, Java was like radical OOP world. And you could, you could often see like in community that, peop that when people were looking at lambdas and other like functional and other functional geekery, like they, were, they, they didn't consider this a friendly thing. But now, suddenly, in Java 8, we got all those new things, uh, well, like lambdas, optional streams, which were heavily uh, functional programming inspired. And some people considered this, well, even started calling this Java release as functional. But after some point, people started noticing that, well, it's not really functional. We got lambdas, we got optional streams, but, well, Oh, streams and optionals are far from being perfect, and lambdas obviously is not something that defines um, language as functional. So this is where the idea for Waver uh, started in. So guys started implementing all those nice features known for other functional programming languages like Scala. So basically what Waver has inside is has completely new collections API, which is fully immutable and persistent. Um, it has a set of new functional interfaces, um, finally tuples, and set of new functional control uh, structures like optional, try, lazy, uh, match, either, and, and future. So in basic Java, in basic JDK, we got basically optional streams and computable future, but usually on everyday basis we use optionals and streams. Um, 
But now we got all those new tools to play with. And my goal for today is to basically go and show you um, how to use them and how, how can you get familiar with the Waver library, which is basically becoming a new, new Guava for Java because Guava introduced us basically optionals and some well, workarounds for dealing with collections in a para-functional way, but it was without lambdas and very nice, concise way of passing f actions around, it was super cumbersome to use it. If you remember, if you, if you try to mimic a stream.map.map.map in, well, in Guava, it, for every map you would need, for every one liner that you would have in like Scala or Waver, you would need to produce like four or five lines because you needed to basically implement anonymous inner uh, class, interface, anonymous inner classes to pass behaviors around. So, um, what I'll be doing today is creating test cases. Well, not really test cases, but it's super handy to have multiple main mains in one class. So I will try as much as possible to create new, new tests and not re remove already existing code. So for the beginning, let's familiarize ourselves with the basics of, of conventions that Waver uses. I don't know if you remember, but um, if you deal with functional interfaces in Java 8, there are, fun there are ones called like function. Well, pretty easy to remember. You have predicate, consumer, runnable, uh, by predicate, by consumer, binary operator, binary operator, and many more. So, for example, for me, it was very confusing at the beginning because, well, I, I just wanted to pass the lambda around, but I needed to decipher what by, uh, by consumer is. So, here is much easier because you have, well, everything is represented by a function, well, with different, of course, uh, different generic parameters. What's also super, super easy to remember is that if you, want to, if you want to create a function with some amount of uh, input parameters, it's super easy because you just, in this case, you just write function, function one, function two, function three, where our function n, well, can you see this? Just let me know. Can you see the code? Okay. So function, function n like this and so on and so on. And this is, this, is, this is super handy, because if you, if you look into uh, Java 8, you have um, function, by function, well, and that's all. Basically, you, by default, you can accept up mo at most two parameters. But if there were more, there would be like try function, quad function, octa function, and, uh, well, my English is not good, good enough to remember all those words. So this is super handy, because if you want function two, function three, with, you just go with a number. This is thing that I can remember. So we have function one, function two, function eight. It goes up to eight. Obviously, if, if, you, if you're gonna ask the question if someone really implemented this by hand, no. Um, everything is done internally by a, by a Scala code that generates Java classes. So whenever, if, if you really want more, you can just tweak one parameter, recompile the whole library, and you get uh, more names like this. Okay, so this is what you know. The same applies to tuples. You have tuple one, two, three, four, and and so on. So whenever you want basically more than more than one, you you need to just append this number over there. What's also super nice when it comes to creating uh, new instances of classes is that whenever you want to create anything, you have this um, list of method. I mean something of, um, and this allows you to create a new instance of this particular thing. This is bas basically, this is the biggest, the most useful feature of Java 9, the collection factory methods that will allow you to create immutable instances using of. So this, this is the most important part uh, for Java 9, but you, we have this on Waver already. Um, what's also super handy is that um, you are not forced to creating everything like this, because there are some shortcut, shortcut forms that bring your syntax much closer to like Kotlin or, or Scala. So whenever you want to create a list, for example, of some elements, you can use the helper method, static utility, um, factory method that looks like this. And if you perform static import over there, 
as you can see, we get something that looks much more Scala-like. So if you really miss that syntax, this is the way to go. And it works for everything. It doesn't work only for collections, but works for tuples, options, tries, and so on, and so on. So this is super handy. OK, so let's now go through some basic functional control structures available in Waver. So, well, the most popular one would be probably the option, which is, the, well, like optional from Java, but it's uh, serializable and has few uh, other nice features. Um, how many of you are familiar with optionals from Java 8? Quite a lot of you, but I see some hands down there. Um, so basically, what, what optional is, is a, well, if you've seen the previous talk, you probably already know, uh, but optional is a nice way in a, of handling uh, nullability or optionality in a functional way. Since we are dealing with languages that are strong, strongly statically typed, well, let's leverage this. So let's use basically approach called type-driven development, and let's create a type that will handle this one particular aspect for us. So this is what, what optional is doing. Whenever you want to create, well, express op optionality, well, forget about nulls. You can just use a special type designed for this and return something in it. And this is also very nice because when you, when you, get, when you pass this code around to someone and the person will, let's say, call some service and gets an optional, um, they can get an optional and it forces them to actively think about both situations, about when it's present or not. So, well, it's a nice way of, way of handling nullability, but additionally, you, well, it's a good thing well, for team communication, because well, there's, you don't need to write docs saying that this is null or not, or explaining. Well, if it's optional, you need to be prepared for both cases. Well, if you are, if you are very, like, um, evil person, you could still, of course, return null as, as an optional, but well, only, only bad people do this, and I don't see any people like this here. So, um, whenever we want to play with optionals, well, there, we, we already have some instance, and there is this monadic ways of dealing with them. So, you have methods like map, flat map, which accept functions that um, are basically expressions of your will. So you, we got the string over there. Let's say we want to uppercase it, but at this point, we don't really know and don't really care if something is inside. So we are expressing our will that if this is present, this should be actually performed. And there are additional methods that you probably know, like filter and so on and so on. But there are also some very nice features about this option. Of course, it can be serialized easily. Um, this is not the case with Java optionals. But also, if you go over there and try to, I hope you see this. If you go for the type hierarchy, you will see that it extends um, value, this mighty value, and the value extends iterable. OK. So we have an optional that extends an iterable. Why would you ever want to do that? Because basically all those, um, all those fancy types like optional, try, and others, those are form of containers. They can contain some value and contain not, which basically, from some point of view, makes them iterables. Well, that can, that can have on zero elements or uh, at most one element. And there are some pretty um, useful situations that, where we can, we, we can use them. So for example, imagine that you have uh, a list of optionals. Whenever you had, um, in Java 8, when you were playing with streams, well, it was super, un well, it was doable, but it wasn't super um, easy to do. Let me show you. So in Java, in Java 8, basically, well, I'm working on, Java, on waiver classes right now, but the same uh, applies to Java. So. If you ever wanted to extract those values from the list of uh, optionals, well, you would need to do very manually. So you would need to go, just go, uh, take this optional, manually, oh, wait, sorry, filter, check if this optional is actually present, 
in this case, is defined. And then perform mapping um, using optional, optional get. Um, and here's a question. Where should, when, in which situations should you actually use optional get? Never, exactly. Well, there are, well, there are very specific situations where you should, where you can use that, but you really need to have good reasons for that. But the whole point of having this, well, special types that handle nullability is to leverage the, the nice API that can handle, uh, help us handle the nullability. And basically what get does is just extracts the value from the inside. And if nothing is there, it throws an exception. So it's basically a syntactic sugar for converting null pointer exceptions into no such element exceptions. So not very useful. So in Java we would also perform a collect here, and we have and we have like four lines for doing such a basic operations. But if you know what flatmap does, flatmap makes a, allows us to uh, collapse nested structures. And what we have here, we have list of optionals. Well, list is actually an iterable. Option is an iterable too. So we have a nested list of, well, we have nested structure of iterables. So if we want to collapse the structure, what we can do over there is perform a flat map and feed it with an uh, uh, identity function. Well, it's all. And in this case, we ended up with only one line that allows us to collapse the whole uh, structure easily. And as you can see, we have a list of integers over there. And if we try to now display what's happening over there, you see that there are no optionals there, and we ended up with a collapse structure. So this can be super handy in some situations. Another thing that's super handy that you probably will use every day is a try. This is a kind of, do you have any idea how it works, guys? OK, so if you understand the optional already, the try is also a very easy thing to understand because it works in a very similar way. It has very similar API. Um, but instead of nullability, we are dealing now with exceptions. So, so instead of putting value that can be nullable inside, you can put a value that's, well, that can, well the expression that can produce uh, some exception. So let's try with new URI because URIs, um, they throw exceptions, uh, many different ones. So what happens over there? We, we created a try, for, uh, which represents a result of this computation, which can throw exception or not. And in case of optional, we had, uh, well, we had optional, two states of optional. It could be empty or present, or not empty. And here is pretty much the same. But we have either success or a failure. So again, we can perform some operations over there. We have an URI over there. We can convert it to string back again. We can filter it. Well, in this case, let's just not filter it, but let's show the API. And the same as with optionals. It will not get performed if the uh, exception appeared somewhere on the way. So it's super nice. Um, and if we want to hand, if there was some exception, we can use one of those methods that allow us to specify, uh, let's say, the, the default value. But that would be pretty boring if we had only like map, flat map, and get or else methods on every of those tools. So um, there are also other very useful uh, methods in this API that you can find. Well, it's pretty big, so you can't see all of them. Um, but the very interesting one introduced in waiver 090 is recover with. So this is, for example, a function that allows us to, well, if we know how to deal with one particular kind of exceptions, in this case, that would be URI syntax exception class, then, then return this. Well, then they'll give a function that returns something. Oh, nothing. What was this? It returns another try. OK, so we can just continue going on with using uh, another try. That returns another URI over there. Sorry, I hope, I hope you guys can all see this. And this is, again, super handy because we, let me actually finish this one. And this is super handy because we can e easily just get over 
those those cases over there. So this is super handy. And another thing that was introduced, I don't really know why it doesn't work. Um, another super nice thing is uh, lazy, which is basically a realization of Java in of lazily initialized values. Actually, we could do this. We could achieve this in um, Java 8 by using suppliers. If you know this pattern, you could write create a supplier of integer sub. And now you just write a lambda expression that returns uh, something, that returns 42, for example. Um, it's, it should be like this. But there is one problem with this. Um, if you create computing over there and try to print it out, we can see that if you run it right now, It doesn't run anything, obviously, because again, it's an exp expression of our will, and we are actually not well. We are not doing anything with this value, so there is no need for actually computing this. Let's say we need that. We can call get. Great, it was computed. Wait, but what if we try to get it a few more times? Well, it becomes problematic because well, it's. Uh, lazy initialized, obviously, but it's, it gets lazy initialized every time you, you try to reach for this value. And this is, well, this is not really perfect. So let's see how, what we can do with lazy in this case. Let me just copy this one. So now, again, if you, if you want to create lazy in waiver, Again, you, can, you need to use method of. Um, again, you provide it with supplier. Here we have computing. And then return some, some value. Obviously, if we run it right now, nothing will happen. Um, let me just introduce the value, lazy. Obviously, if we get this value right now, um, it will get computed as expected, but if we, well, try to get it multiple times, what's super, super nice that we still get it only once. So this is basically how you achieve a really, like, really lazily computed values. What's also super, f um, so what's interesting is that it has this com API known from options, tries, and other stuff. So, well, you can, of course, map it. Either there is a filter, and so on, and so on. And obviously, it will get calculated only uh, when you actually reach a value. So you can actually define all those nice uh, pipeline over there with map. Um, it's integer, so let's just add plus one. <coughs> and obviously, this will get calc everything will get calculated when you actually reach the value. So. Those are free, free functional control structures that you that well that you can use basically on everyday basics. But another thing that, well, the most for me is the most interesting in in Waver is the whole new collections API. Um, if you look at Java collections API, well, you will obviously notice that it didn't change for quite a lot of time. Well. It can't change because it, Java needs to be backwards compatible. But if you look at the design of the collections API, you will see that there are methods like add, remove, add, add all, and get, or other like this. But if you look at the, what they actually return, you will see that they, re, they never return a new instance, but rather they return some metadata. They return Boolean if the operation was successful, integers, or some rather, rather different values. And it makes it actually super hard to implement uh, fully immutable structures using this collections API. Well, if one of your core, if one of the core blocks of your language is the collections API that well discourages immutability, it's super hard because other libraries use it. Core, lib core libraries of JDK use it. Well, so it becomes super crazy. So. Um, in, wa in Waver, in order to leverage fully um, immuta immutable structures, the collections API needed to be totally redesigned. So in, in the whole collections API, whenever you are modifying something, um, you never get some, you never get anything, or you never get some metadata. You always get a new instance, modified one. So you never modify what was already created. There are a lot of many uh, 
benefits of immutability. But there are also, well, obviously bad sides of it. Well, if you implement immutability in a very naive way, well, what would that mean? Let's say that if you want to add, well, million, million elements to a list. So if you go naively immutable, if you implement it, what would you do? Well, you create one list, you add an element, create a copy, add another, create a copy, create a copy, create a copy, and you're not very happy because you added million elements, but you have million lists right now. And this is not perfect. So in order to deal with such situations, um, there was uh, a new, well, there, is, there was a new concept of collections, of implementing collections uh, designed. It's a concept of persistent collections. Well, have you ever heard about them? Okay, so is the, is persistent, persistence. Persistence usually means something you put into a database. Do you put those data in a database in persistent collections? Do you think so? Okay. Okay, so actually it has nothing to do with persistence when it comes to databases and storing it uh, it's somewhere. But persistence in this case means whenever we are modifying those structures, we don't really, well, copy everything, but try to reuse everything as much as possible. So if you have a list of one element and you add another element straight, straight into this, well, instead of just creating copies, you reuse the previously created list to create a new one. And in this case, you form those crazy recursive uh, structures. And in this case, you save a lot of memory. And this is how it's implemented in, in, in Waver. Um, this, uh, this applies to lists, maps, and all the stuff. Actually, with lists, it's very easy because you pretty much store, uh, we create, define a list as a, its tail and a head element. Um, but with maps and other stuff, it gets pretty crazy. Um, if you want to r r learn more about this topic, there is a great talk by Oleg Shelayev uh, from Zero Turnaround. This talk was presented on Java One um, DevOx here last year. Um, and in a few other spots, basically it's called Functional um, Data Structures in Java. Well, it's a one hour talk about how you implement these things. But so we already know that collections are. Um, persistent and immutable. So let's have a look at the API they provide. So the basic one is list. Obviously, you can create them using of or of collections factory methods. So let's create something. One, two, three. That's a nice list to have. Hello. OK, and I don't know but if you remember, but um, I remember when I first played with Java 8 Streams API, well, the API was super overwhelming for me. Um, but after some time, you actually start noticing that it's, well, that it's not perfect. So there are many useful methods missing. So, and they, here you can find basically all of them. I hope you can guys see all of this. So for example, what was, um, very hard for me, for example, for Streams API, there was no possibility of like generating stop, uh, of stopping taking elements after some predicate gets matched or unmatched. It was, so, it was super hard to use in some situations because for example, if you, if you wanted to create an infinite stream of your custom objects, well, if you create an infinite stream and natural way to limit it would be a filter method. But if you have an infinite stream, you use filter, it keeps getting generated. So it doesn't stop after, after the filter fa uh, get, does, does, doesn't match an element. And in this case, everything explodes. So here are the answers for situations like this, like drop right, um, drop until, and so on. Actually, the, the same stuff will appear in Streams API in Java 9. So besides doing this, you have nice methods like, like drop, for example, drop one element, um, you can um, take, take a tail of it, take other stuff. Um, and what's interesting, if you actually, if we go back to over here, to the original list, you still see that this one is untouched. This means basically that all those um, calls, they create new instances and don't modify what was um, over there. So it's less spots where you can actually make mistakes. Another thing, let's go, let's copy the list.
You have even crazy methods like cross product. You can create cross product of all of, of, of all elements. Um, you have a zip method that allows you to zip it, zip your uh, one collection with another collection into form pairs. It's super handy. Um, especially in Java 8 streams, I had situations where I need to artificially create uh, infinite streams on integers only to use those integers as indices for taking values from a map, for example, to form pairs. And it was very uncomfortable. And here you have methods like, for example, zip with index that basically do this on the spot. So if you see what's happening over there, you, it easily created pairs of um, values and their indexes. So as you know, the, as you can see, their API is uh, very rich. But there's also a very nice, cool feature. Um, if you actually have a look at those, for example, a list, Um, you will see that there is something like collect method. So if you got used to a streams API, it will, well, you can still leverage something very similar. But if you actually look closely, yes, that turned off. If you actually look very closely over there, um, there is uh, one of the implementations that accept collectors. But Let's just remove that. And if you see over there, this collectors comes from Java util stream. So this is the perfect way of achieving like interoperability between um, Waver and Java uh, and Java 8. Because here you can pretty much reuse all already existing collectors that were used in stream API. So whenever you need to play with that, all those familiar tools known from stream API are, um, are over here. Another thing is, if you if you look for the whole like collections API uh, the hierarchy, you will see many like familiar names. You will see trees, lists, uh, arrays, and so on and so on. But there is one uh, one class that we really need to look at, uh, which is stream. Well, in Java 8, streams are a fancy form of iterators. Those are not really collections. Those are basically something that you create on the spot to perform a fancy mapping, and then you need to recollect everything straight to, a, uh, to, to whatever you want. But here in Waver, streams are actually um, very, um, those are real collections, OK? So there are no limitations. They are reusable. You can reuse them all the time. And obviously, they are lazily initialized. So actually, let's have an example. You probably know this method from Java, like iterate. Let's create a simple, like, infinite stream of um, integers. We'll create them like this, which means that we are starting our stream at 0 and incrementing it by 1 every iteration. So let's actually keep it here. And here comes the question. What will happen? Well, it was a false start. So obviously, um, nothing happens over there. Oh, it's Java YouTube stream. We don't, we don't want that. Oh, wait a second. That explains a lot. We need IO waiver. <coughs> this is stream. Let's go to imports and let's get rid of Java util stream because we don't need that. So now, if we actually iterate, I don't see that. Yes, this one. So if we actually re-implement that, we see that we created a, a stream that's, that comes from Waver. And if we actually try to uh, print the content of it, well, it's an infinite collection. So well, should it explode? Not really. Since this is uh, lazily computed, the, what, what we get here actually is a stream of, well, the, the element that we have, and we don't know actually nothing. 
because when you think about streams, well, it, it's actually, it applies both to Java 8 and Waver. They are both, um, they are both lazy. So you think about current element, and you never know if the next one is here or not really. So let's try to modify that. Let's limit the whole stream to 10 elements, for example. So what do you think will happen now if we try to have a look at what, what's inside? Um, if we try to do that, you will see that, well, the result is still the same. Why is that? Well, it's take. Um, it's still, we didn't really tell anything what do we want to do with those elements. We just took 10 elements. We created infinite stream, but limited it to 10 elements. But there is still nothing that we are doing with it. So it's still another expression of, of our, our sequence, but still um, we are not doing anything. This is why it's still, it's still lazy. If you actually want to do something, you can, for example, perform, perform forage um, or something similar. And now you see that this will actually get evaluated. Obviously, if we don't limit ourselves to 10 elements, well, it will end up, end up very bad. But now we are consuming, uh, consuming the stream, and we can see um, all of this in action. Actually, when it comes to um, the whole collections API, it's also super interesting um, because there is a problem. Um, for example, when I was playing with, with Spring, JPA, and Waver, we had problems because we needed to make um, JPA work with immutable classes, immutable structures, and it wasn't super easy to do, okay? It was doable, but super uncomfortable. Well, now there is Spring Data. Spring Data supports Waver collections out of the box, which makes it kind of easier, but at some point there was a problem because there was a situation that we basically needed to take um, some elements from, well, some, some collections and pretty much repackage it to Java classes to be able to, well, store it somewhere to use some other frameworks. Well, and in this case, for example, we decided to not use persistent collections from Waver because, well, it was very hard to justify uh, repackaging every collection every time you basically uh, need to use it. But now, um, some new solutions appears for that. So whenever you basically want to uh, repackage something to something known in Java, you have something like to Java list, to Java array, and other, um, other methods over there. So as you can see, it's very um, elastic when it comes to what you are, well, to do with many conversions. But if you look at the implementations, those pretty much take every element and just take it from one spot to the other. But recently, uh, new uh, converters happened. Do we have now something like as Java or as Java mutable? And what's happening over there, it's not really a, a repackaging thing. This is a full implementation of full Java implementation that delegates all or from all methods from Java interface to the underlying waiver collections. So in this case, we, we don't have linear time when doing conversions, but we have constant time. And well, that's useful. Um, so we have streams, lists, trees, and other stuff. Basically, you have all collections that you would basically ever need in there. If you, if you are actually missing something, you can, you can go to GitHub, you can raise an issue, and the community is super friendly, so you can basically just, well, they will either, someone will implement it, they will encourage you to implement it, or they will, well, tell you very politely why this shouldn't be implemented. So, but Waver is not only uh, collections and, uh, and functional interfaces, um, we have also, for example, tuples. For quite, um, well, for quite a lot of time, we are still missing tuples in Java. Well, we, when we want to use a pair, we still need to well, implement it ourselves or just use one of the dozillions uh, libraries on GitHub. But in this case, you can basically, well, we have everything that we need over there. And as you remember, well, tup, well if you need to have like, n elements in a tuple, it's super easy to remember because you have all those numbers over there. So, for example, if you want to create a, a simple tuple, let's say of uh, Java and 8, and 
That's all. We already have it, and we can pass it around. Of course, it's immutable as everything. And you can see here that, well, you can access those um, separate elements from of tuple, but also you have this v API that's similar to optional tries, list, and so on and so on. So if you already understand how to use optional streams, collections, and so on and so on, you probably already know how to use tuples and other stuff, because API is super similar. And obviously, we, you have very rich API that allows you to like perform any well any possible operations on those uh, on the on, on the stuff. So, for example, if you want to like do something with the stuff inside, you can either use a map. But if if you use a map, you will get another tuple as a result. So you can you can easily chain chain methods. But if you use uh, this one, you will get uh, you will not get everything wrapped in tuple. So now, if you if perform like this, you can see that it will you can see that that it works. Another super interesting thing is: um, Have you ever tried playing with? Um, have you ever tried playing with um, checked exceptions and lambdas? Do you know that pain? The problem with functional interfaces in Java is that um, those interfaces that represent functions, uh, they never have froze uh, clause in there. And this is problematic because well, there are situations where we actually need to have something that throws an exception, a checked exception, in the lambda body. So let's have a look of such situa situation. So let's. Let's try, for example, create. A, um, let's cre create a list of strings, and let's try to create URIs from them. So, as you can see, well, this is the problem because we have red stuff over there. Well, it sounds that we are missing an exception. So, first thing we think about is that, well, we should probably add it over there. Well, but it's here. And no, unfortunately, we need to try catch it. So as you can see, it doesn't look very, very promising. But there is a feature, additional feature in Weaver that allows you to deal with this kind of problems. Have you ever heard about sneaky throws? Guys, sneaky throws, anyone? Sneaky throws is uh, basically a way of throwing checked exceptions well, when compiler is not looking at you. Um, so you see, this doesn't work. There, there is basically a combination. If you, if you use uh, uh, type inference and some other, some other tricks, you can create functions that throw checked exceptions without uh, defining them, without defining them in a throw signature. Um, and this is what you can actually achieve using API unchecked from waiver. And now, if you, can, you can see that if we use new URI, oh, I hope you can see that. String. You can see now that suddenly everything stopped complaining. And if we actually, um, if we try to actually just static import it, and looks, it looks pretty nice. Because if you read it now, you have list of um, map unchecked and then new URI. So this is, well, it still throws a checked exception, but it's not there. It can be useful because if you have, like, for example, a long chain of stream API, of map calls in a stream API, um, you probably are interested if any of those produces any exception. You want to try catch the whole thing and not every body inside Lambda separately. So usually you would need to just swipe it under the under the carpet or something by well by ignoring them or just repackaging into runtime exceptions. But here, um, basically you can um, do this. Well, you can use the trick to trick your compiler and um, save some some time on it. So this is it when it comes to uh, collections. 
The last thing is that I would like to cover today is basically uh, pattern matching. Pattern matching is, um, if, you've, if you've seen the previous talk, you already know that pattern matching is basically like a switch case uh, on steroids. In switch case, you are very limited. You can use strings, you can use enums there, um, some, some other values, but the real pattern matching allows you to go much, much deeper. So if you have a look at here, uh, this, obviously, everything you can, you can static import. You put the value inside, and now you are creating cases in which all of these values can fall into. All those things need to be defined inside this um, crazy looking dollar, um, dollar bracket sign. This is where you put every, every pattern. So, for example, we have this nice utility classes that, well, utility class that has predefined predicates like instance of. So, if you have a string class, you can, for example, return return this one. The bad thing about this is that obviously there it's it's more like a um, D DSL for Java of doing this, and not there is no language support for that. So, unfortunately. This will probably compile, uh, well, at the very end. So for the whole time when you're playing with this, everything is rather, um, everything is rather red, and when you finally find, well, the right combination of the stuff, it starts being nice. It, it either red disappears. We might be missing one here. I think it's there. This is int, this is string. Let's static import that. Instance of string. This should be over here. And so on, so on. OK, um, we don't have, unfortunately, that much time. So if you have any questions, um, you have five minutes, and I will, be, I will gladly answer them. And I will try to fix that meanwhile. Oh, yeah, it works. Just a bracket missing. So um, we walked through the basics. Wait a second. We walked through some of the basics of the waiver. Well, obviously, there are much, many features. But if you would really like to know all of them, you would need to probably spend the whole day, whole day of for a few days of training. So I gave you basics, and now is the right time to go and explore everything and have fun, because it it's makes your Java experience at the end of the day much uh, more fun and pleasure. OK, any questions? <coughs> um, I don't hear you. Can you, uh, can you speak louder? Um, I don't really, I don't really know how it works right under the hood in in Waver in the concrete implementations, um, but the, um, if you Google, you'll you'll find solutions. You will see that um, basically it's all about defining a generic uh, generic method that throws uh, throws an exception, but uh, you put some runtime exception over there. And, but before throwing the actual runtime exception, you throw, you sneakily, you um, you cast your checked exception into into uh, a throwable or something, and then you throw it. Um, and this combination, this some, this kind of combination of this, those elements give you a situation when compiler infers the uh, exception to be a runtime one and not a checked one. So you are just sneaking in under the uh, well when he's not looking, and, and this is this is how it works. I'm not sure which way they did in waiver, but well, this is this is the way you need to play with. Well, the negative implication is that the checked exception, well, you, compiler will not force you to catch it. So this, this, this is the main implication. So, well, usually you probably shouldn't use it on everyday cases. But as you can see, this case with lambda expression is a very common thing that where it's actually fine to use that because you, you don't end up with n try catches. You can place it with one easy. Well, so obviously it's a trick, not for everyday use, but there are certain use cases where it will be really useful. Uh, is it an 
Okay, there was quite a lot of questions. Uh, first thing, the, the, there's not very big difference between uh, optional from waiver and uh, Java, especially that, well, in most Java APIs you have normal optional return, uh, returned, so there's, I, I, I personally, I don't repackage them into options, but if I, if I design my own, own APIs, I will use um, option from Java, from waiver for the sake of consistency. Um, answering your other question, well, technically options, streams, and other, well, they are. They have this paramonadic design, but for example, optional from um, there are some. As I remember, there are certain like corner cases that prove that they are actually not. I wouldn't consider them as as monads, but something that. Well, I wouldn't consider it as a monad in a sense of algebra, but more like a monad in a sense of the uh, design pattern that exists in uh, in the programming world. So, well, you obviously have those maps, flat maps, they, but there are some certain corner cases, like, for example, passing nulls, where it doesn't uh, obey the monadic laws. So, well, it's almost a monad. Same with streams. Try is not really a monad, because well, when you get an exception from a try, you can't reverse the operation. So, uh, well, again, it has the des monadic design, but it doesn't obey the monadic laws. Um, another question was about a try. If to, why not use try instead of uh, why not use stuff unchecked? Uh, because in this case, we actually we don't care about handling exceptions at this point. We could say we have a stream with n map calls, and we care if any of them throws an exception, for example. Okay. So if we use the try, it would still f force us to handle every every body, every, every body of a lambda separately. And this, well, this is, still, this is still painful. And unchecked is a way for like passing this exception around further, for further, well, for being caught further. So we are two minutes behind time. Thank you very much. Uh, I committed and pushed slides on GitHub.